Welcome everyone to Don't Let Fear Stop Productivity, a conversation with creditors' rights expert Rick Purr. Welcome to our webinar on compliance regulations. Through the Noble Biz Industry Education Initiative, our company is taking a proactive approach to educating the industry and providing the latest regulatory updates and providing the most current information available. On today's agenda, we've got several items. First, an introduction to our speakers, an overview of legislative initiatives, presentation from our guest, Rick Pear, and questions and answers. We'll also be doing an audience poll at the beginning to find out what are the most uh, interesting and biggest concerns you have regarding compliance. So here we go. Your options are keeping current on regulations, modifying current systems to stay compliant, identifying best practices, updating technology to increase compliance, or the very generic other. Please take a moment and register your vote. Great, it looks like the votes are in. 54% have voted keeping current on regulations. Now, on with our presentation. Today's guests are Gordon Kraft, Chief Customer Officer for Noble Biz. Gordon has more than 25 years of experience with both startup and Fortune 500 companies in the collections and customer engagement industry. Today, Gordon will be speaking with Rick Park. Rick is a partner at Feynman, Kreckstein, and Harris PC. It is a nationally recognized authority and lecturer on creditors' rights, representing creditors, law firms, and agencies against individual and class action allegations invoking federal and state consumer protection laws, including the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Gentlemen, welcome today. Thank you. Yeah. Both Gordon and Rick were participants at two recent events in the credit and collections industry. Gordon attended the credit and collections news conference in Marnock Beach, California, and met with Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes. And Rick was at the ACA Washington Insights Conference with Noble Biz President Phil Brzezinski, who met with U.S. Representative Blake Farenthold in D.C. Gordon and Rick, can you share with us what were some of the big highlights or takeaways from these two events? And Rick, let's start with you. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the ACA had its uh, Washington Insights Confer Conference uh, a week and a half ago, and uh, you know, one of the insights that was was great was the opportunity to speak with um, former staff members at the Federal Communications Commission, as well as an opportunity to talk with members of the and and employees of the CFPB uh, about trending issues and circumstances both in the rulemaking that's coming up as well as their concerns about the collection industry and listening to our insights on um, what are the issues that are facing agencies and how has regulation affected them. Um, so it was really eye-opening and an opportunity to get to talk directly to the decision makers as well as getting some insight on some important things, particularly uh, TCPA uh, from, from the FCC's perspective. Okay. Uh, Gordon, what about you? What did you see in the legislature? Well, I was fortunate enough to attend a seminar over the uh, last three days. Um, and within that, there was several speakers, both attorneys, uh, representatives from the FTC, the FCC, as well as uh, Edwin Shaw, who is one of the early hires from the CFPB. Um, and while there was a lot of ground covered, uh, I'd like to... Uh, open it up as they opened it up, which was talking about some of the new recent regulations coming out of the state of, the, of New York. And uh, this looked like a precursor to some of the rulemaking that the CFPB may be 
considering releasing uh, sometime at the end of this year. So, uh, Rick, if we could start there, maybe your thoughts on uh, what co what is coming out of New York, and is that something people should pay attention to as they look at uh, what CFPB does at the end of this year? Yeah, thanks, Gordon. The I think that 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 it's a a good model to take a look at. Maybe not necessarily for content, but both the breadth and scope of the rules, what subjects they're tackling, and in fact how the drafting of the rules are being responded to by both agencies and consumers. Um, one of the interesting things that, that I had the unique opportunity of sitting down with about eight or ten decision makers at the CFPB, and they were very interested in um, the, the feedback from agencies and others in the field to what New York was doing. Um, you know, one of our, our biggest points that we tried to make to them was clarity. Clarity in rulemaking, clarity in terms, um, and understanding that on its face, while something may seem to be clear, the, that the CFPB needed to go the extra mile to make sure. And by way of example, we talked about the, the, the words that they use in the New York regs, charge off. And while it may seem on its face that, that the word charge off is pretty clear, the reality is, is that it's a technical financial term mostly used by banks and others. And by hovering their rulemaking along a certain definition that didn't apply to a lot of particular types of obligations, such as medical debt, which most doctors don't technically charge off, um, or student loans or other things, they increase the confusion amongst the people who are supposed to um, comply with those regulations. So I think the CFPB is definitely taking a look at how the industry is responding to the New York regs and are going to try to see what pitfalls occur, how to avoid those when they issue their regulations. All right, great. Thank you, Rick. Maybe th this might be a, a good time to kind of switch to the national attention with the ANPR and any updates that uh, you might have gotten from your time in Washington. Well, the um, as everyone is aware, the, the CFPB put out its advance notice of public rulemaking. That was November of 2013, and in there they had a, 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 a extensive number of questions, probably more than most practitioners who have dealt with rulemaking in the past throughout a number of federal agencies had seen uh, in anyone's memory. Uh, basically, there were 162 questions, all with multiple subparts, talking, asking about every different facet of debt collection. Uh, there were numerous responses by people in the industry on both the consumer and collection side by creditors and others, vendors and, and people in, in the uh, collection space and the arm space. Um, and that closed in February and March of 2014. Since then, everyone has been waiting for the CFPB to issue its proposed rules. Uh, and what we heard from the CFPB is that they're getting closer. and uh, there are a couple procedural steps they have to go through, but it wouldn't be surprising based on what they had to say to see rules come out uh, in the fall or early winter of 2015. So I think that, that we can expect to see those rules, and in fact, while traditionally the implementation of rules, because they'll take a, a, a series of comments again um, and then have an implementation date, it would not be surprising to see rules come out in, in a September, October time frame with a potential for implementation in January or February of uh, 2016. So that would not be shocking based on the comments uh, coming from various members of the CFPB. All right, good. Thank you, Rick. It, now, there's a, we know there's a lot of material to be covered uh, relative to the ANPR, but specifically, as you're well aware, Noble Biz is a company that offers a shield of products uh, that are compliant-driven technologies, one of which is caller ID. So could you expand, uh, perhaps, as it relates to what's happening in New York, the ANPR, 
and what you see uh, and your thoughts relative to caller ID management. Well, clearly it's a, a topic of uh, interest by the CFPB, and, and they asked two specific questions, um, although I guess using the word specific is, is probably a misnomer, um, that were extremely detailed. And, and uh, one question you know, really delved into the impact that caller ID and transmitting caller ID information had in the collection sphere. Um, you know, the, the, the CFPB recognizes that technology is to the benefit of both consumers and collectors. Um, they understand that consumers today want to be communicated with uh, through updated means of technology and that the FDCPA and other statutes, uh, you know, the FDCPA was written in 1978, the TCPA came into being in 1991 and the world's a very different place. So in their questions, uh, questions 85 and 86, they start looking into and trying to delve into wh what are the pros and cons, both of caller ID, um, today's technology, you see call screening, third-party disclosure, um, and local um, number calling, to try and find out really what the benefits and risks are um, commensurate with what the FDCPA is really trying to protect. And I think that they're very proactive in trying to allow agencies and third parties to take advantage of today's technology. They don't want to see uh, the arm industry kept in the Stone Age, and I pretty much expect um, that we will see positive developments in terms of technology um, for caller ID for communications, for um, local number calling, when the CFPB issues uh, its, its rulemaking. And here you see uh, from this slide, uh, you know, question 86, where they specifically went to talking about um, altering the telephone number um, or changing a, a telephone number. Now, really, their focus is more on um, some of the bad effects, not not the the actual doing it, but where it is being done with the purpose and intent to be deceptive or misleading, not where um, legitimate agencies and entities are using local um, calling in jurisdictions in which they're able to do business. Great, Rick, and, and I think we're all anxious to see what comes out of the rulemaking and where their focus uh, lies going forward. So uh, let's let's move forward and. Let me ask, what are some of the latest uh, compliance issues that you're seeing in the industry within the CFPB, at TCPA, and other areas? Well, the, the you know, what we are seeing, and, and while we're always cognizant of what's happening with the, the CFPB, with the Federal Trade Commission, um, one of the biggest areas that we get to see is when the compliance issues that the regulators are addressing are overlapping with the areas that plaintiffs, consumer plaintiffs attorneys are bringing in numerous lawsuits throughout the United States. One of the core areas is the collection of out of statute debt. Um, you know, very early on with the, with the CFPB, we saw the asset acceptance um, consent agreement along with the Federal Trade Commission in which uh, they really set out very early on to discuss their concerns with the collection of out-of-statute debt. Now, they're uh, hindered in part because uh, uh, under just our clear elements of our federal government and federal and states' rights, you have a, a situation in which states have statutes of limitations, and many states allow the collection of debt beyond a statute of limitations so long as no one threatens suit or threatens to take legal action where you otherwise wouldn't be able to take legal action since the debt is out of statute. Um, that doctrine um, was addressed in the Buchanan case in which um, the CFPB took a position in which uh, a collection agency had written a very simple letter asking about resolving or settling a debt, made no mention of litigation suing 
uh, or otherwise taking any legal action, filed a motion to dismiss when they were sued because the plaintiffs said that by using the term settlement and resolve that they were in fact threatening legal action because a least sophisticated consumer believed that the words uh, settlement, resolve, um, implied litigation. The CFPB took the position that while that may be true, they did not believe that on the initial foray on a motion to dismiss that it was appropriate for a court to just summarily not allow the plaintiff to proceed um, and to instead allow the plaintiff to determine and develop evidence to see if in fact um, the letter isn't threatening um, legal action implicitly or otherwise based on other facts. The uh, uh, court in Buchanan, the appeals court, actually after after the agency won a trial court, the appeals court reversed and followed the uh, CFPB's lead and suggested that in fact uh, even using innocuous language such as settlement and resolve wasn't a scenario that should be resolved by a court at the outset of a case but rather required some discovery. I will say that having talked to the CFPB last week uh, and explaining to them what has happened and the reaction by many agencies to stop even making settlement letters in any way, shape, or form out of the fear of litigation that um, that was they believe was not their intention with the language that they had in Buchanan and, and were taken a little bit taken aback by the effect that their position has taken on, on the collection industry um, and, and really were surprised at the results. So, and we may see some reaction to Buchanan. Um, the Crawford case out of the 11th Circuit in um, out of Alabama um, dealt with a proof of claim in which a agency creditor received a creditor's notice for a bankruptcy that was filed regarding a debt. They filed their proof of claim. Uh, the debt was time barred, but nevertheless, they followed the court procedure. This was a court proceeding, and the trial court um, – they were sued for an FDCP, FDCPA violation for very similar reasons, saying that the filing of a proof of claim was a legal action to which you were not entitled to take because the, the debt was outside the statute of limitations. Surprisingly, the Court of Appeals in the 11th Circuit – reversed the trial court's dismissal of the FDCPA action and said, in fact, filing a proof of claim in bankruptcy was similar to filing this independent separate litigation to which um, you were not entitled. Uh, this, of course, uh, is, is directly opposite a number of courts throughout the United States uh, and put a little bit of shock in the industry. And you have seen plaintiff's attorneys pick up on this by trying to bring litigation throughout the United States, arguing that any proof of claims that are filed on um, out of statute debt are in fact a violation of the FDCPA. Interestingly, um, several courts have rejected Crawford since that time, trial courts and other circuits. And in fact, even in the 11th Circuit, a trial court um, has rejected Crawford in a very narrow sense on an issue that the court did not address which was did the bankruptcy code preempt the FDCPA, and there they ruled that in fact did, um, and that the filing of a proof of claim was not uh, – uh, the, the requirement under the bankruptcy code to file the proof of claim um, did not impose liability under the FDCPA. So it will be interesting to see that case move itself up uh, the ranks and to see how the 11th Circuit tackles um, this preemption argument. That's great, Rick. Thank you. Cl clearly, uh, out of state, uh, out of statute debt is an important area. Um, and how you communicate, whether it's by letter, whether it's by telephone.
keep talking, Steve. Hello. Hello, Rick. All right. Are we going uh, back uh, hopefully, we're back online. Everybody, I apologize. We had a slight power surge here and shut down our audio. So, uh, apologize for that. Certainly, as a uh, telco company, that's never something you want, but we were quick to restore it. So, apologize. <laughs> So, Rick, what we were talking about is is uh, clearly the the um, statute side of debt is an important area. How you communicate with customers, whether by phone, whether by letter, it, it's very important that there is legal scrutiny over the words that are used um, because they have different implications and meanings. Are there other cases in other areas um, that we should be aware of that this audience should be aware of? Yeah, I mean, just one one last issue on the uh, on what I'm seeing as a trend, uh, a, a very um, active trend on the plaintiff's litigation side, is regarding collection costs, uh, which they argue are not yet due. And what do I mean by that? I mean that um, in most cases, agencies uh, are engaged with their creditor clients to collect on obligations uh, and to do so. Um, and we could move the slide back one. Uh, that, that, that they're, they're engaging to do so on a contingency basis. They don't get paid until um, uh, they collect the debt. So what you have is that active scenario in which uh, if you're on a 25% contingency and the, the consumer owes $1,000, you will either communicate by letter or otherwise to the consumer that what is due and owing is $1,000 in principal and $250 in collection costs. Or you may just say that due and owing is $1,250. What plaintiff's attorneys are doing now and have been doing uh, probably since uh, 2009, but it's really picked up a lot of traction, is suing by arguing that, in fact, the collection costs are not due until such time as the consumer pays. Thus, by saying that the collection costs are due in the present moment is deceptive and misleading. Uh, of course, the effect of that is um, – if you were to say that only $1,000 were due, then collect $1,000 and subsequently call up the consumer within five minutes of them paying the bill and saying, by the way, you owe me another 250 for the collection costs that you legally are, are obligated to pay under the original agreement, you'd be sued for deceptive and misleading conduct for not telling them the amount that they had to pay to satisfy the debt. Nevertheless, um, uh, there have been a lot, of, a lot of litigation, and the plaintiffs have been very successful. And just recently, um, uh, it, it, there was a case in the uh, Court of Appeals of the Third Circuit, McLaughlin, which uh, held that collection letters were subject to that standard. And they just recently, as of April 7th, issued an opinion dealing with pleadings the same way. And Kmark was a case, Kmark versus Bank of America, in which there was a foreclosure proceeding. There was an obligation to pay certain attorney's fees and costs. Once a... Um, property was foreclosed upon, um, but it didn't become due until such time based on the, at the, at the, at the uh, core of the documents until the foreclosure took place. And so in the foreclosure proceedings, the law firm hired by Bank of America um, put in there seeking relief in the amount of the attorney's fees plus the costs that were set out in the original mortgage contract. Um, the trial court granted um, summary judgment to the law firm, yet the Court of Appeals reversed, saying that, in fact, the amounts were not due as of the time of the filing of the foreclosure proceedings. They were not due until after they successfully obtained foreclosure, and that they could have used different words in the pleading other than to say that they were seeking both the attorney's fees and the costs. So it was interesting that um, – the court expanded this doctrine not just to apply to collection letters and to communication, but also to pleadings. And so, uh, you know, I caution people in either putting in their letters or otherwise uh, communicating with consumers about collection costs that uh, you look at how you're presenting the fact that those collection costs may have to be paid, and you'll probably want to speak to your counsel about some language that will not give the impression that it is already a due and owing number. But we see this litigation been popping up uh, dramatically in leaps and bounds uh, over the last several months. And I don't think it's going to stop until um, the industry sort of comes up with a uh, some sort of some 
type of safe harbor language uh, similar to the interest language that was came out of the Seventh Circuit talking about the increase in uh, interest and the accrual of interest. So it's something to definitely keep on your radar, take a look at your letters, take a look at how your uh, staff is trained to talk about collection costs because um, I, I really see that the courts are buying into the plaintiff's arguments and it's going to be somehow in some way that the, the industry is going to have to modify how it's, how it's asking to be repaid those collection costs by the consumer. Great information, Rick. And again, the courts are continuing challenging to the industry where it's important to keep up to date on what should be done. Let me take that to the to the next step and talk about there's a lot of bad actors out there. We all know that. And, and the agencies are starting to focus on things like phantom debt. But recent case, the, the CPS case, um, where a consent decree occurred, if you could talk a little bit about that and what lessons learned we get from that. Well, you know, for, for the people that are not familiar, and, and we have on the slide, the, the single paragraph in a, in a multi-count complaint uh, dealing with uh, consumer portfolio services in which um, the Federal Trade Commission uh, and they came into a consent decree, it's the one aspect in which they talked about um, telephony and communica communication and, and technology um, that were impacting the caller identification process. And if you look at the, the conclusion of the paragraph in the complaint, they talked about CPS's purposeful manipulation of caller ID information to deceive consumers and deprive them of the choice of answering their phone. And what was a key component of that was that CPS was alleged to have attempted to manipulate the caller ID so that they had consumers that were purposely avoiding their calls and so they were changing their telephone numbers. They were, uh, as soon as the callers identified that a particular number was coming from CPS, that um, they were um, then changing the number to try and talk to those people. So it, it's, it's important to, to look at this not from the standpoint necessarily that there's anything wrong with caller ID technology or local number calling technology, but the fact is is that even innocuous and innocent technology, if manipulated and used in an improper way, can still bring liability. And this was a circumstance in which um, the FTC determined that that was what was being done with the technology. So we're always cautious. It's 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 uh, to say, you know, if you're using the products for the purpose for which they're intended, um, you're probably going to be on the right side of regulators. However, even if you take lawful technology and do certain bad things with it, um, the fact that the technology itself may be lawful is not going to protect you from uh, uh, the unlawful means in which you're using it. All right. Thank you, Rick. Um, we're going to move to questions and answers, and I'm going to start off with with a question that I get all the time. But Rick, I'd like the idea that clearly the collections business and using technology within the collections business to help you drive compliance has uh, elements of risk in terms of not just the technology, but how you use that technology. I'd like to get your thoughts on what are the risks associated with using caller ID or any other types of technologies that are out there. Well, I mean, the first thing is um, if we start looking at, um, you know, a any risk, look, it, you know, I I've had many of my clients and many agency owners uh, who, who say if they wanted to completely avoid every chance of ever getting sued or ever anyone taking a look at anything, they wouldn't pick up a phone, wouldn't mail a letter. Um, and I think that that's uh, the same in almost any industry in the country. Um, success doesn't come without taking some risks that are out there. And sometimes it's the risk of the unknown um, or uncertainty. I know that if we take a look at something like the Noble Biz local touch products, we have seen that every conceivable risk and risk factor that you would weigh 
seems to all weigh in favor of utilizing the product. First, you get the success of the product in, in its um, um, uh, clear economic benefit to the agencies that are able to increase right party contacts. Then you take a look at that, okay, so what, what are some of the downsides? What have regulators said? And in every instance, regulators have said that um, there seems to be nothing unlawful about using technology in this way for legitimate businesses who are licensed to do business in um, the appropriate jurisdiction where those companies control the numbers, where those numbers are called back to um, the uh, agency. And if you do a callback, uh, you know, you can receive the phone number back. Then you say, okay, well, let's look at what have the courts said under the FDCPA. And the courts um, have taken uh, – the, the courts have taken a position that have decided it that it's not deceptive or misleading. That, in fact, if it's used properly and that the uh, agency does receive the telephone number back, uh, and if the agency is, in fact, licensed to do business and, and collect in that state, that uh, um, that is not uh, a violation of the FDCPA. And that came out of the District of Minnesota. In fact, the agency that was using it um, – was using local touch, so so it was directly touched upon. And then lastly, from the litigator's perspective, I get to, to look at it with, okay, what kind of cases are we getting? And the cases that we're seeing are none. There are no cases in, in actuality that are being bought by plaintiff's attorneys um, relative to um, uh, caller ID technology. It's just not prevalent, not like what we're seeing when we look at the Douglas letter cases or we look at collection costs or we look at out-of-statute debt. Plaintiff's lawyers are just not bringing these suits. So I mix all those things together and I say, you know, could somebody change their mind? Could a regulator suddenly decide it's unlawful? Sure, anything's possible. But the reality is, is that against every measure, um, there has not been a pushback by regulators, by courts, or by plaintiffs, consumers, attorneys um, uh, against this technology. And because of its success, you know, w as a lawyer, I see that, that the risk is extremely small. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, let everybody know that's on the call. Please type in any questions you have. We have several questions coming in. This is your chance to ask the expert. So, Rick, a a question has come in um, regarding TCPA, and certainly TCPA is impacting the industry as a whole, uh, and there's lots of uh, unknowns relative to the definitions of ATDS, what you can, what you can't do, and contacting consumers using um, their cell phone. So if you could comment on that, please. Well, I mean, the, the, the whole concept uh, of what's happening with uh, um, some of the TCPA litigation that's going out there, you know, there's been a big question about capacity. Um, we're seeing uh, questions of uh, does the dialer have the present capacity um, to engage in certain conduct? And, and what you've seen is some, again, some of the unique nature about talking about capacity, these simple words that were written into a statute in 1991 that are really coming up to play you know, in 2015 about concepts that no one had any clue about in 1991. When you when you when you talk about adding additional software designs to these programs, to where the, some of these dialers are connected over cloud-based networks um, to potential software packages that you could install or download, almost like apps. And so the litigation takes that bend where you have a otherwise compliant product and you have a manufacturer um, in which the, the manufacturer may add, offer an add-on or a modification, but that the individual agency did not purchase or did not subscribe to. And the plaintiff's attorney argues that, in fact, the capacity to subscribe to it thus changes the, the dialing system to have the capacity to do what is prohibited. And fortunately, the courts have begun to take the position that it means present capacity, meaning does the system have it, not could you purchase it. Not could you put that app on your phone, not could it, a software uh, module be installed, but is the software module installed even if it's not being used on the system uh, in, in its present form? 
unfortunately, the courts are, are taking that, that look and saying, no, if it's not there already, that doesn't count as capacity. So uh, and relative to other types of laws, agency, regulations, the rulemaking coming out, what's your, what's your thought on what can we expect from these agencies between now and the end of the year? Well, the, the federal communication, I think the strongest factor is going to be the Federal Communications Commission, which has, uh, has oversight of the TCPA. Um, they have been um, has they have been provided with a number of petitions uh, from various members of the arm industry and people outside of the arm industry trying to tackle um, the problems of this, this out of control TCPA um, litigation. I mean, you had a situation in which uh, uh, you know the Los Angeles Lakers were sued. Uh, for TCPA for sending text messages to their season ticket holders in a class action lawsuit. Uh, and the SEC recognizes that, that, that the way that it is being interpreted and, and read has created uh, a, a windfall for plaintiff's attorneys that are, that are suing and, and, and manipulating the purpose of the statute. Um, you know, from listening to the, the uh, former staff members of the FCC and very recently former at at the ACA Washington Insights Conference, you know, we were able to at least get some insights, uh, not to steal the word, from them that suggested that the SEC is ready to act, is ready to take some action, but while still protecting consumers to take away um, uh, the abuse of the TCPA that's been impacting um, the, the arm industry and, and, and everyone who's using a, a dialing system uh, throughout the United States. And, and I think that you can expect to see in a very short order, uh, within months, uh, a decision by the FCC on the current petitions, um, which will provide relief um, definitely to the arm industry as long as they are not using um, uh, random and sequential number generators and, in fact, are utilizing uh, their telephone dialing systems to communicate directly with consumers for whom they already have telephone numbers um, and for which, the, you know, they, they have... Uh, the opportunity to to manually load those into their systems as opposed to um, just randomly making numbers up. So I, so I expect to see a response. Uh, it may not be all encompassing to what the industry is seeking, but I think it's going to go a long way to eliminating the current scenario where any predictive dialer is deemed to be an ATDS simply because it's a predictive dialer. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a question that came in from Chris. Uh, what is the CFPB's, CFPB's position on credit bureau reporting? Well, you know, the, they are very um, concerned about the impact on credit reporting, um, both in the manner in which it's being reported, making sure that things are timely, making sure that data furnishers are supplying um, uh, their dates of first delinquency and, and, and taking um, uh, trade lines off of people's consumer reports in a timely fashion, but they're more concerned about um, the impact of medical debt on credit reporting. You see, unlike most consumer obligations that you'll see on your credit report, whether it's your student loan, your mortgage, your credit card, those are voluntary decisions made by the consumer. And in that way, you're actively seeking um, credit and if you don't repay your obligation in a timely fashion and you're being penalized by it by having it on your credit report, it tends to be a reflection of your credit worthiness. However, medical debt seems to be a little bit off that sphere. Why? Because most of the time that people have excessive medical debt that they're unable to pay, it's the result of an accident, an emergency, a catastrophe for which nobody planned or nobody intended to have that debt. And because of that surprise factor that's involved, while they may not have the means to pay it or satisfy it, it isn't necessarily a true accurate reflection of someone's credit worthiness. So the CFPB has been working diligently to rectify how both medical debt is appearing on credit reports, whether it will continue to appear on credit reports, and how it's used in scoring models. And uh, I expect to see the um, 
proposed rulemaking and, and the actual rules um, really take a hard look at the reporting and scoring of medical obligations. All right, thank you. Um, another question that has come in <clears throat> in regards to all the rulemaking that's occurring and expected to get out and the petitions that are in front of the agencies, what can people in the industry do? So, for example, the people that are on this call, how do they get their positions represented properly to the agencies so that there's a feeling that the agencies are listening to the collectors? Well, you know, there's, there's a couple things. One is, is um, you know, to utilize your First Amendment right to petition and redress the government with your grievances. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, if you have the opportunity to, at any of these conferences, forum, or any other places to speak with members of the CFPB, let them know your thoughts. Um, do the same with your, your congressmen and your senators. Uh, they listen, and, and the more that they hear, um, the more it will impact their evaluation of these things. Secondly, there are many trade organizations and associations that are out there that have, have done the legwork and have provided comprehensive responses um, to the regulators. And I, and I would you know, recommend and advise to become active in those organizations and, and, and let your opinion be heard. I know almost all of them seek active input from their members uh, in formulating their responses to many of these questions. Um, so you know, let, them, let them hear that. And lastly, um, you know, when the proposed rulemakings are put out and, and the rules are done, go over it with your counsel. Uh, you know, get a good idea of what you can and can't do, what, what's the landscape going forward, and if there's issues or problems, uh, you know, address them then. And, and I'm sure that there will be a second round of public comment and, and input uh, after the rules have been released, um, trying to identify the scope and impact that they're having uh, on the arm industry, maybe three, six, nine months after the implementation, uh, to see what, what real effect it's having. All right. Great, thank you. And, and I, I encourage everyone to get involved, uh, particularly with ACA is a very good organization that represents uh, the industry well. Uh, I got a very good question in from Don. Uh, and uh, I'm going to frame it a little bit because if you look at the CFPB complaint database, one of the big um, uh, complaints is that the consumer says it's not my debt. And the question here is, is there a limited number of times a debtor can dispute a debt after it's been verified by the collection agency that it is reported correctly? That's a great question. Um, and if you're talking in... And I'll answer, answer it in a couple ways. One is the CFPB that, that, that maintains its complaint portal. Um, you know, that's an independent entity, and I don't know that they have any particular guidelines for frivolous response um, in, in terms of identifying it as, as being frivolous um, or preventing consumers from continually bringing things in. Although I think that in your response, you can identify it and hopefully bring it to the attention of somebody uh, from that perspective, on the on the actual credit reporting side, you know the Fair Credit Reporting Act does outline um, a uh, set of standards by which the consumer reporting agencies can deem a dispute to be frivolous. I just caution any agency that is a data furnisher from taking it upon themselves to determine that in fact the dispute is frivolous. Uh, if you receive a direct dispute or a, an ACDV through the consumer reporting agencies. I mean, that's a scenario you may want to talk to your counsel about, um, but I just caution anyone from unilaterally determining that something is a frivolous um, dispute consistent with the definitions that are even under the Fair Credit Reporting Act as a data furnisher. I would tend to leave that to the reporting agency uh, itself uh, just to avoid liability. All right, thank you, Rick. We, we have a, a question from Chris. The question is, has the CFPB or any other regulating body taken a strong position on variable message strategies outside of FOTE, such as Zortman or uh, Zwickenhoff? Um, they they have. I mean, if uh, one of the recent uh, 
and I'm trying to remember which uh, agency they had a consent decree with, um, and it's just slipping my mind, but in one of the consent decrees, and remember, even, even though the consent decrees are public, they are a private negotiated settlement between a private party and the government. They don't have the force of law um, as if it was a regulation or a rule, but it does give you some insight into how um, the regulators are thinking. And in one recent um, uh, consent decree dealing with messaging, the CFPB suggested that in making telephone calls to a number you are not sure belongs to the consumer, to use a Zortman message and that in this consent decree they, they required the agency to effectively do this. And then after they identified that in fact a number was specifically associated with a specific consumer aside from a telephone number that's a, uh, a work number or other third party number. But if they got the residence number, they could thereafter um, uh, use a traditional message uh, which would be fully compliant and uh, um, would um, be a, a message that we're used to hearing, which is we are a debt collector. The purpose of this call is to collect the debt, and we're calling for John Doe. Um, so they did do that split messaging uh, in the consent decree, and it would not be surprising when the when the rulemaking comes out if we see something similar um, on a national level. Okay, good. I have a question here from Megan, uh, and uh, to, I'll frame it this way: there, there's been some recent uh, interest in this the phantom debt area, and as it relates to robocalling, and specifically, the question is: is uh, how will the Global Connect legal activity affect the industry? Well, and, and that's a, a, a great question, and it's a, it's a, there's a, you know, not an easy, not an easy answer. Um, and the reason it's not an easy answer is because bad facts make bad law. And the circumstance that you're referring to with the, the, the individuals and entities that appear to be very bad actors creates a scenario in which there could be bad law. Um, the phone messages and others that were being utilized in that case, if you had the opportunity to uh, uh, look at the scripts, were not good. Um, the what's being alleged that was being said um, was something that it was pretty apparent um, were unlawful uh, in, the, in their form and content. And so what you end up with is a scenario in which the CFPB says, look, this stuff is so bad that you, the gatekeeper, you, the vendor who were supplying this, are now going to be held responsible because you should have just you couldn't turn your back on it. It's that bad, and if you don't have situations in place in which you um, at, at least monitor for a, a base level of compliance, then you shouldn't be in this business sector. Now, why is it bad law? Because you know you're opening up to, to the practicalities of a lot of these entities that are assisting us in the arm industry, who don't have the, either the technical expertise or the wherewithal to be monitoring every company that does every um, uh, you know, every action that anyone's taking, particularly when some of these things are being done um, privately. But uh, you know, the, the the bad facts of this case opened itself up to where CFPB is, is able to step in and and probably do something it wants to do. Um, but uh, you know, it may create that scenario. No different than a letter vendor. If you were to send a letter out and the letter said in big red letters on it pay or go to jail, you know, the CFPB is, would take the position that, look, the vendor, the vendor before it puts it in an envelope has an obligation to say, I can't do this. And that's really what the uh, comparison was uh, here. So um, it, it, it is bad facts. I think it could lead to, to bad law and oversight. Um, and it'll be interesting to see um, how that turns out. That's certainly one we're going to keep a close eye on. So thank you, Rick. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody today for joining us. We hope it was informative. And Rick, what I'd like to do is you've covered a lot of ground. So perhaps you could maybe give us uh, your thoughts on what are the key points that people should be continuing to look at. I think that clearly, um, you know, compliance isn't going away. 
Uh, and anyone that thinks that, that um, this will blow over or the CFPB will go away or the change in legislature or the change in the president is going to going to change the CFPB, it is not going to happen. Um, compliance is important, um, and it is a regulated marketplace, and the world of the arm industry is going to be on parallel to the regulations that you see both in the health and medical fields and what you see on Wall Street and, and elsewhere, and I think it's here to stay. And it is important that you embrace the compliance because you're going to find both you, your success is going to be measured not just with regulators but with your own clients um, based on, on the, the systems you have in place uh, uh, to maintain your compliance. Um, but you also have to understand you're in the business to make money, not tread water. And by that I mean, look, it, 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 if, if you know, you're being told don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, and what you're finding is that if you don't do a lot of different things and you play it completely and utterly safe 100% of the time, so if you're not, if all you're doing is breaking even as a business, then you're not going to be successful. And so, you know, uh, the technology people out there recognize that you're here to make money, but you can be both compliant and successful by making the appropriate evaluation of your risk. Just like I talked about before with evaluating the technology that, that local touch and the analysis that's gone into looking at that, what are all the factors, what are all the things there, big upside on getting increased right party contacts, low downside based on every empirical piece of data out there regarding both compliance, litigation, um, and court interpretations. So. If you're able to make the appropriate evaluation of your risk and figure out what areas of technology are going to help you um, and that they actually have helped, you're going to find that you can be both compliant and make money in this industry. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Rick and Gordon, for sharing your insights and expertise today. Thank you to our audience for investing time to learn more. A recording of this webinar will be available on our blog later today. Please use it as a reference and share it with your colleagues who couldn't make it with us today but should learn what you learned today. And learn more every week with NobleBiz. Read our blog, follow us on Twitter, follow our company page on LinkedIn, and of course, contact Rick Pair at rpair at feynmanlawfirm.com. Thank you, and have a great day.